أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين وهو خير ناصر ومعين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين أما بعد My respected elders, my dearest youngsters, brothers and sisters in Iman, Assalamu alaikum jami'a wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In this lecture, we're going to continue our discussion from the previous episode in which we were talking about shirk and uh, giving some more insight into the Milla of Ibrahim alayhi salam, what Tawheed means in the Milla of Ibrahim alayhi salam and how divinity in the Milla of Ibrahim alayhi salam is identified and defined. And we were trying to focus and showcase how in the Milla of Ibrahim alayhi salam, the ability to hear your calls and your prayers from across the curtain of Ghayb is taken to be an exclusive divine attribute. It's taken to be the ultimate sign that an entity is God. And that's why when his people tell Ibrahim salam that we worship idols, and so if you're worshiping them, it means you consider them God. So Ibrahim salam's very first question to them is that, okay, if you worship them and if you consider them gods, then the first question you need to answer is, can they hear you when you call out to them? So if the answer to this question is yes, then at least as far as the Milla of Ibrahim salam is concerned, your worship and your devotion to such entities is justified. And you can indeed refer to these entities as gods and it is proven that they are divine. If they can hear you across the curtain of Ghayb. And if they can bring you benefit and harm from across the curtain of Ghayb, the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings us benefit and harm and causes us benefit and harm from across the curtain of Ghayb. So these are exclusive divine sifat and attributes in the Milla of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And the unfortunate thing is that within the Ummah of Islam, there are some groups that do believe in these kinds of powers for entities other than Allah, particularly pious personalities like prophets and saints. Okay, and this in the Milla of Ibrahim goes against Tawheed. This was the first point that we were trying to elaborate in the previous lecture. Now, as you proceed uh, with your tadabbur on this passage, you will see that Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam gives you other qualities, other attributes through which he identifies and defines his God. So the God of Ibrahim alayhi salam is the one who <clears throat> is the Lord of all the worlds. He's the one who guides Ibrahim alayhi salam. He's the one who provides him with food and drink, with his risk. When he gets sick, he's the one who cures. He's the one who will give him death. He will bring him back to life. He's the one who Ibrahim alayhi salam places hope in to forgive his iniquities, his mistakes. On the day of retribution, interestingly, if you focus here, he is also the Lord that Ibrahim alayhi salam asks and prays to and supplicates to. Okay. He wants to be united with the righteous. He wants to be given an erring judgment. Who does he ask? He says, my Lord grant me. So, Rabbi Habli. Your Rabb, your sustainer is the one whom you ask to grant you your wishes. Okay. Unlike today in uh, sectarian communities that have distanced themselves, unfortunately, or that have drifted away from the Milla of Ibrahim alayhi salam, you will see them asking entities other than the Rabb to grant them their hajat, to grant them their needs or to ward off affliction. Similarly, when he wants a worthy repute among posterity and he wants good mention in the last generations, he addresses Allah and says, confer on me a worthy repute and make me one of the heirs to the paradise of bliss. Forgive my father, for he was the, one of those who were astray. Do not disgrace me on the day that they shall be resurrected. 
the day when neither wealth nor children will avail except him who comes to Allah with a sound heart. So from this you can see that in the middle of Ibrahim والسلام, all your devotion, all your worship should exclusively be focused on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these sifat, these qualities and attributes that Ibrahim السلام, has mentioned in this passage should be reserved exclusively for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you share them or transfer them to the slaves of Allah or to entities lesser than Allah and other than Allah, then in the middle of Ibrahim السلام, you have fallen into shirk. So this is a very crucial teaching to remember for all of us. Once that is clear, in this lecture, I want to go deeper into showcasing before you the status of dua and what dua looks like in the middle of Ibrahim السلام, because in previous presentations, we established that dua is afdalul ibadah. It is one of the best acts of worship. It is a superior act of worship, a paramount act of worship. So in the middle of Ibrahim السلام, you will see if you study the practitioners and the proponents and exponents of the middle of Ibrahim السلام, if you study their seerah, as it is covered in the Quran, you will see a very consistent trend and pattern among the followers and practitioners of the Abrahamic tradition and Abrahamic Milla from among the great prophets of God who came before and after Ibrahim والسلام. And that's why I want to showcase before you what dua looks like and who it is supposed to be directed to in the middle of Ibrahim السلام. These reminders are very crucial for people in our own communities and also in other sects who unfortunately, under the influence of Ghulu, have been deceived into thinking that one can indeed make dua to and supplicate to and ask hajat across the curtain of ghayb from entities other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and still remain firmly in line with the Millah of Ibrahim السلام, and with the tradition and teaching and practice of the earliest practitioners of, of the Millah of Ibrahim السلام. We want to disprove this and for that, we welcome you once again to come to the Quran. We will be uh, using the same edition, uh, the Ali Quli Qarai edition that was published by ICAS Press in uh, 2004. And uh, the verses that I want to refer you to are actually found uh, from pages 455 to 456 and then 457 to 459. On the PDF here, uh, we can go to page 487. You will see here from verse 51 of Surah Al-Anbiya, the story of Ibrahim السلام, begins when Allah says certainly, we had given Abraham his rectitude before and we knew him. And then Allah recounts a conversation that he had with his people. And then uh, his, his statement to his people, he said, do you then worship besides Allah that which cannot cause you any benefit or harm from across the curtain of Ghayb, obviously, because on this side of the curtain of Ghayb, there are a lot of entities that can cause us benefit and harm even animals can harm us and benefit us plants can harm us and benefit us so causing benefit and harm through natural means while remaining on this side of the curtain of life is not a sign of divinity sign of divinity and the marker of divinity in the middle of ibrahim is when you are able to exercise these powers and wield these powers from across the curtain of ghaib and so you can see um, as you progress through this uh, surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the uh, progeny of Ibrahim alayhi salam, how Allah gave him Ishaq and Yaqub and he made each of them righteous and he made them into imams. So one thing to keep in mind is that imama in the Quran refers to prophethood actually. 
a lot of the times, uh, 12 Rashi'as in particular, they tend to confuse Imama of the Quran with post prophetic Imama. They are two very different things. Uh, the Imama in the Quran is actually uh, divinely appointed prophethood because when Allah talks about who is he talking about? We made them Imams. Who did he make Imams? He's talking about Ishaq. And Ishaq was a prophet. Yaqub was also a prophet. So when Allah says we made them Imams, the Imama here is Imamatun Nubuwa. It's referring to the Imama of prophethood, not the non prophetic Imama that the 12 Shias uh, believe in. Right? So it's very important to distinguish between Quranic Imama, which is another word or a synonym for prophethood and for prophets. So when Allah talks about Imams uh, in this context, He's talking about prophets from the progeny of Ibrahim. And that's why He says, Yahduna bi emrina. They used to guide by our command because prophets do not guide based on their whims or desires, they guide on the basis of Allah's commands that come to them through his revelation and inspiration. Because Allah says, Wa awhayna ilayhim. We reveal to them. We sent wahi to them. So these are imams who are receiving wahi from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whereas post-prophetic imams are ulama abrar. They are pious, righteous scholars who do not receive any wahi from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rather, they simply transmit the sunnah as they receive it from their ancestors from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. So in any case, Allah then talks about وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْهِمْ فِعْلَ الْخَيْرَاتِ We inspired, we sent, we revealed to them uh, the importance of performing good deeds, the maintenance of prayers, the giving of zakat. وَكَانُوا لَنَا عَابِدِينَ And they used to worship us. And then Allah talks about Lut alayhi salam. But I want to come to the relevant part. Uh, in Surah Al-Anbiya, verse 76, Allah talks about Nuh alayhi salam. Wa Nuhan idh nada. So Nuh alayhi salam, when he called out. So you can see this is an Ulul Azm prophet. But who does he call out to? Well, you can see from the response. Allah says, we responded to him. So who did Nuh call out to? He called out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, if you want further clarity, as to whom Nuh salam exactly called out to. You can look at other places in the Quran where his story is mentioned, where his dua is given to you in more explicit terms. For example, in Surah uh, Al-Qamar, Rabbi inni maghloobun fantasir. So he makes the dua to Allah that, Ya Allah, I have been overwhelmed. I find myself completely overwhelmed. Fantasir. So therefore, send your help. So who is he calling out to? Rabbi. He's calling out to his sustainer. So that's what we are trying to establish is that the, the way of the prophets is to call upon the sustainer, to call upon the Rabb, not to call upon entities lesser than him. And so the first example in Surah Al-Anbiya is Nuh alayhi salam. He calls out to whom? To Allah and Allah responds to him and delivers him and his family from the great agony, from the great calamity that descended his people. Allah says, and we helped him against the people who denied our signs. So the help came from where? From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not from any entity lesser than or other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now you come further down into the Millah of Ibrahim. These are now practitioners, prophets who were upon the Millah of Ibrahim alayhi salam. You have the example of Job. Job is Ayyub. Okay, Prophet Ayyub alayhi salam. Wa Ayyub idnada. Rabbahu anni masani adurru wa anta arhamur rahimi. In verse 83, Allah gives you the example of Job, who is Ayyub alayhi salam. When he called out to his Lord, you know the story of Prophet Ayyub alayhi salam? He was afflicted with, uh, with physical disease and suffering that befell him at the bodily level. And so, You'll notice how when people fall sick today or they develop a disease, unfortunately and very sadly in the Muslim Ummah, it is common among certain groups to seek shifa across the curtain of rape from entities other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So people suffering from cancer sometimes will, call, will, will actually go to ziyarah, to mashhad, ziyarah of Imam al-Rida alayhi salam. 
They will seek the cure of their cancer from Imam al rida alayhi salam. Or some other deadly disease that a person is suffering from. Back in the days when COVID-19 was uh, gripping Iran, there were videos coming out of that country showing you uh, doctors actually teaching patients who are in the COVID ward to actually actively call out to Imam al-Mahdi to relieve them, to, to cure them of the coronavirus. Whereas the message of the Quran and the teaching of the Quran and the, 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 the information that the Quran gives you about the practitioners and followers of the Millah of Ibrahim is that when you are afflicted with distress, when you are suffering from physical disease, who do you call out to? وَأَيُّبَ إِذْ نَادَى his nida, who did he call out to? Today they will teach you Nadi Aliyan Madhar al Ajaib, right? This is a fabricated uh, supplication that's attributed to the Prophet and to the Imams, even though our scholars have established that it is a fabrication. It's, a, it's actually a Persian poem uh, that later, later on got translated into Arabic. And it has no asl in the sense that it cannot be traced back to the Aimma alayhi salam. But still, you'll find it's very popular. And Nadi Ali teaches you that when you are in distress, you know, whenever you are in distress, who do you call out to? Nadi Ali and you call out to Imam Ali alayhi salam. The Quran is teaching you if you're a follower of the Millah of Ibrahim alayhi salam and a true man of God, like Job, like Ayyub, who is your nida supposed to be directed to? Is Nada Rabbahu. When he call, called out to his, his Lord, his sustainer. When Allah is the sustainer, when he is closer to you than your jugular vein, and if you say, well, Allah is so close to me, but I am far from him because of my sins. Well, the whole point of Allah telling you I am closer to you than your jugular veins, you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't know about your sins. Despite your sins, he is telling you that I am still closer to you than your jugular veins. وَلَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ وَنَعْلَمُ مَا تُوَسْوِسُ بِهِ نَفْسُهُ وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ Allah says, we indeed created the human being. We know all of the thoughts and inner ideas that come in his mind. So Allah knows even your innermost thoughts. And Allah says, even after knowing your innermost thoughts and knowing everything there is to know about you, even after that, we are closer to you than your jugular vein. So no matter how sinful you are, you cannot be more sinful than the kuffar and mushrikeen of Makkah. They are committing the sin that's most hateful in the sight of Allah, that's most reprehensible and disgusting and deplorable in the sight of Allah, shirk. And yet Allah shows you repeatedly the Quran that when these kuffar and mushrikeen call out to him in a state of distress, they make dua to him, when they are caught in the waves, when they're about to drown in the high seas, in a storm, at that time, they cry out to Allah, they supplicate to Allah. And they say, oh Allah, if you save us and if you help us out, we shall be among the thankful. And Allah says, I respond to them. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is close enough to those kuffar and mushrikeen who are the worst sinners, if he responds to their prayers, then what makes you the mu'min and Muslim who is trying their best to follow the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What makes you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not listen to your prayer? What makes you think you are so distant and far away that you should not be able to call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? In any case, in the Millah of Ibrahim alayhi salam, as you can see, Ayyub alayhi salam is a practitioner and follower of the Millah of Ibrahim. And when he is in distress, when he is suffering from bodily sickness and disease, who does he call out to? Idnada rabbahu. He does his nida is directed to his sustainer and he says, Anni masaniya dur. Indeed, suffering has befallen me, distress has befallen me. Wa anta arhamur rahimin. And you are the most merciful of the merciful. So this is really beautiful. A lot of people, especially in our communities, don't focus on this name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Arhamur Rahimin. Arhamur Rahimin shows you that even if there might be entities other than him that may have varying degrees of mercy in them. And so let's say, let's hypothesize and let's assume or suppose for the sake of argument that Imams of Ahlul Bayt have mercy in their hearts for us. 
even then Allah is saying that they are simply, they would simply be merciful, right? Allah is saying you have access to the most merciful of those who show mercy and who have mercy. So when you have access to the superior entity, why should you try and communicate? Why should you seek the mercy of lesser entities across the curtain of life? In any case, whatever you do, the Quran is giving you a uniform pattern, a uniform trend. We started with Nuh alayhi salam. He called out to Allah and Allah responded to him. This was in verse 76. You come to verse 83 and you see Ayyub alayhi salam. He gives his nida. He calls out to his sustainer and he says, Ya Allah, distress has befallen me and you are the most merciful of the merciful. Fastajabna lahu. So we answered his prayer and removed his distress and we gave him back his family along with others like them as a mercy from us and an admonition for the devout. Allah says the reason why I gave Ayyub all of this and then I decided to announce this to the whole world is so that this should be dhikra, it should be a reminder for the Abideen, for the devout worshippers. If you are a worshipper of Allah, you should know that just as Allah answered Ayyub alayhi salam when he, when he called out to him in distress, Allah is saying, I want this to be, I'm mentioning this in the Quran, why? So that it should be a reminder to you and to all the worshippers that Allah is very close to you. Allah will listen to your dua, He will relieve you of your distress. If you seek help from him and him alone, the way the practitioners of the Millah of Ibrahim السلام, have been doing for millennia, for, for thousands of years, for centuries. Then Allah talks about some more pious prophets and personalities from the past. And then in verse 87, he talks about Yunus السلام, Nuni, Subhanaka inni kuntum min al Yunus alayhi salam is the man of the, the fish, the one who was swallowed by a whale when he left his people in a state of anger, thinking that we would not put him to hardship, we would not take him to account for this. When he found himself in the darkness that enveloped him and encompassed him from all sides inside the belly of the whale, in this state of distress, he cried out. And who did he cry out to? Did he cry out to Imam Ali alayhi salam or to Prophet Nuh alayhi salam or Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam? He's a follower and, and, and Shia of Ibrahim alayhi salam. But still, you can see these are great prophets of God. Yunus alayhi salam is not as great in station and ranking as Ibrahim alayhi salam. If seeking the intercession of entities who are higher in station uh, before Allah than you was uh, something that was considered permissible by prophets and by men and women of God, you would see Yunus alayhi salam resorting to this because Yunus, Yunus alayhi salam at this point in his life had fallen out of favor. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was displeased with him for having abandoned his people and for having left them without authorization. And so now that he has fallen out of favor, Yunus alayhi salam should have tried to seek shafa'ah of some other higher prophet who was well pleased with Allah, like Ibrahim alayhi salam or Ismail alayhi salam or Nuh alayhi salam. But Yunus alayhi salam is a true follower of the Millah of Ibrahim. He knows that there is no such provision or no such arrangement whereby you're, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not aslan, he has not asked you to go to any entity across the curtain of ghaib and seek their intervention or their mediation or their intercession. As Imam Ali alayhi salam says in letter 31 of Nahjul Balagha, which is his wasiyah to his son, he says, وَلَمْ يُلْجِئْكَ إِلَى مَنْ يَشْفَعُ لَكَ إِلَيْهِ He says, oh my son, remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not required he has not required you to bring any mediator or intercessor to intercede for you and then only he will listen to you. No, Allah Aslan has not required any such thing. So all you need to do is invoke your creator, supplicate to him directly without any intercession, without any mediation 
across the curtain of ghayb and he will listen to you the way look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you about Yunus that when he was enveloped in the darkness of the belly of the whale fanada he cried out he supplicated and this was in a nida across the curtain of ghayb but to whom was this nida directed Allah ilaha illa ant. It was directed to the God apart from whom there is no God. And so Yunus alayhi salam called out to him. He said, Ya Allah, there is no God except you. Who will I call out to? Who can listen to me right now as I am covered up in the belly of this whale other than you? It's only your divine, exclusive divine power with which you can listen to me in a remote and secluded place like this. There is no God except you. You are the Immaculate, Ya Allah. And in other words, he's saying, Ya Allah, because you are the Immaculate, we cannot, you know, we cannot perform up to your standards. So whenever you put us through a test, Ya Allah, we will always have shortcomings. And in my case, I am admitting my shortcomings. I have indeed been among the wrongdoers. I am from the Zalimin. So notice how Yunus salam, being a prophet of God does not believe in his own Asma or infallibility. Because Asma and Zulm, they don't go hand in hand, right? Al-Zulm yunafil Asma. Zulm does not go hand in hand with infallibility. And Yunus salam, does not aslan, these prophets do not consider themselves infallible. Otherwise, he would say, no, no, ya Allah, inni kuntu minal ma'asumin. I'm a ma'asum. I have not done anything wrong. Everything that I do is right because I'm ma'asum and I'm protected by you. But Yunus salam, does not believe in Asma. He believes that he has been among the wrongdoers. He has made a mistake. And that's why he's crying out to Allah, seeking his forgiveness, declaring his tawheed. This is a, you know, one of the secret weapons that you have as a believer. If you want Allah to quickly forgive you, you need to invoke him by his tawheed. That's why this kalima, the Prophet and the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, salawatullahi alayhim ajma'in, you will see it uh, occurring as a frequent refrain in their supplications and their du'as. They are in love with this kalima and they really promote it big time. Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi salam, especially he says, if you recite this kalima, uh, he says, what happens in the next verse will happen to you as well. What happens in the next verse? When Yunus salam, calls out to Allah through this beautiful means, Allah says, فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ So we answered his prayer وَنَجَّيْنَاهُ مِنَ الْغَمْ And delivered him from agony. <clears throat> now you might think, and lest someone think that this was only something Allah did exclusively for Yunus salam. Allah says, no, and thus do we deliver the faithful. Meaning, Allah says, I'm not only prepared to do this for Yunus alayhi salam. Anyone else, at any point in your life, if you are among the mu'mineen, Allah says, I, This is how I rescue the believers. So not only Yunus, even if you make a mistake in life, due to which you fall into deep depression, you fall into an abyss from which you see no means of coming out. You know, this situation that Yunus alayhi salam found himself in, a lot of human beings will find themselves in similar situations. He found himself in this situation for a different reason. You may find yourself in this kind of situation after making a different kind of mistake. But the important thing is when you find yourself enveloped in the darkness that has resulted from the evil that you've done and you see no means of escape and you are at the depth and at the you've hit rock bottom you are at the lowest of the low points that is the time for you to follow the example of Yunus alayhi salam and to call out to Allah and say la ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al ya Allah I testify there is no God worthy of worship and divinity other than you I testify against myself that I have been among the wrongdoers. And the verse of the Quran, when Allah ends it by saying, what he's trying to convey to you, and Imam Sadiq emphasizes this point, he says is that Allah is saying that Yunus was not the last person I rescued after he reached out to me like this. Today, tomorrow, in the future, whenever you, the ordinary average believer, 
also attempts to reconnect with me and reconcile yourself with me in this manner by declaring my tawheed and admitting your wrongdoing i will also respond to you and relieve you of your distress so this is the beauty is that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is setting a precedent through the role model of yunus alayhi salam the last dua that we will point out zakaria alayhi salam is also a follower of the Milla of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Allah says, Wa Zakariya id nada rabbahu rabbi la tadarni fardan wa anta khayrul warithin. Zakariya alayhi salam, you can get more details about his story if you visit the opening verses of chapter 19, Surah Maryam. Uh, there you will find that he was without offspring for a very long period of time. He was not blessed with any son or daughter. And so he cried out to his Lord in secret. Now, when he wanted offspring again, because he's a follower of the Milla of Ibrahim alayhi salam, who does he call out to? Unlike some of the unfortunate, ignorant people today, he does not go to any shrine of any prophet or any gravesite, the way people are doing today, going to graves of imams or mausoleums or calling out to imams across the curtain of Ghaib and saying, give me awlad or Ya Abul Fadl, give me a son or Ya Bibi Zainab, give me a daughter. Or Ya Bibi Fatima or Ya Imam Ali, no. This is Zakaria alayhi salam. He's a follower of the Milla of Ibrahim. Who does he, 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 when he wants an offspring, he calls out to, he cries out, but to whom? To his Lord. Was Zakaria idnada rabbahu. The nida of Zakaria was directed exclusively to his sustainer, to his Lord. Rabbi la tadarni farda. He said, Oh my sustainer, oh my Lord, do not leave me without an heir, without someone who will inherit me. You are the best of the inheritors. Allah says, so we answered his prayer. And we gave him Yahya, who in English is translated as John. In Surah Maryam, when he makes the dua, he says, My wife is barren. Allah says, we remedied his wife's infertility for him. Innahum kanu yusari'una fil khayrat. Indeed, all of these prophets that we have talked about, they were active in performing good works. Allah is now highlighting what he really admired and liked about them. Number one, that they were yusari'una fil khayrat. They were very active in performing good deeds. They used to hasten and rush towards good deeds. And they would supplicate us with eagerness and awe and they were humble before us. So do you see how supplicating to us, supplicating to Allah with eagerness, with greed, if you like, with interest and with fear, with awe, and being humble before him. These are the hallmarks and the salient features of the great prophets of God. So I hope you can see I want you to make a list of the prophets that were just mentioned. Zakaria alayhi salam, his dua to his Rabb was mentioned. Okay. Yunus alayhi salam, his dua to his Rabb was mentioned. Ayyub alayhi salam, his dua to his Rabb was mentioned. Nuh alayhi salam, his dua to his Rabb was mentioned. Now I want you to open the same edition, page 106 to 187. If you have the hard copy and uh, if you have the PDF version, you can come to 218. You will see here you have Suratul An'am. Look at verses 83 onwards, 84 onwards. Allah talks about Nuh. He mentions there are 18 prophets mentioned in this passage. Huh? And we have referred to this passage before in the Tawheed and Shirk lectures and also in the Dispelling the Ghulu series. Uh, you have Nuh mentioned, you have, uh, I've highlighted all those prophets whose du'as we just read, okay? Nuh alayhi salam, Ayyub alayhi salam, Zakaria alayhi salam, and Yunus alayhi salam, okay? These are all of the prophets that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala identifies as coming before and after Ibrahim alayhi salam. So from the offspring of Ibrahim alayhi salam, you have Ayyub, you have Zakaria, you have Yunus. And Allah mentions how If they were to ascribe any partners to Allah, 
what they used to do would not avail them. Yani all their good deeds would be cancelled. But now look at verse 90. Allah says, Allah. These are the ones whom Allah has guided. These prophets, and there are 18 of them that I mentioned previously. But among these prophets are Nuh and Ayyub and Zakariah and Yunus. These are from among the prophets that I mentioned in this passage. Towards the end of the passage, Allah says, these are the ones, or they are the ones whom Allah has guided. So follow their guidance. And what is their guidance, my dear brothers and sisters? That we just showed in the matter of dua, their guidance and their instructions are very clear. Their trend, their pattern, you notice a very, very clear trend and pattern in their duas. Whenever these great prophets of God were in a state of distress, whenever they wanted something, any hajat, anything, they asked their sustainer, they asked Allah exclusively. It is my challenge. Nowhere in the Quran can you show any of these prophets making dua across the curtain of Ghaib to any other pious personality and seeking their intercession or their intervention or their help in getting what they want. This is the Tawheed uh, of the Millah of Ibrahim and this is how Dua is in the Millah of Ibrahim. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillah rabbil alamin.